Okay, you remember, because I've said it over and over again, I'm sure you're sick of hearing me say it, that uh, uh, the first part of Mark, the first eight chapters or so, not the whole eighth chapter, but into the kind of the middle of chapter eight, um, Mark is answering the question, who is this Jesus? And we've already seen some of those answers in this section, which begins at five at uh, 313 and uh, goes to 520, uh, we'll see, th see three things about Jesus. We see that he's the um, uh, progenitor uh, of a new uh, nation, a new race of people, a new family. We'll see that he's a visionary of what the world is going to be like as the kingdom of God spreads and eventually takes over everything. And we'll see that he's a victor over the forces of evil and darkness. So first of all, in chapter 3, beginning in verse 13, running through verse 35, um, we see Jesus as the head of a new family. It's a new, wider family. Um, why a new family? Well, because God wants the whole world to know of his love. And Adam and Eve, of course, that was their job, was to spread God's love everywhere, and they failed to do that. Um, and so God focused his attention on a man named Abraham, and through Abraham uh, and his descendants, eventually the nation of Israel arose. And the purpose of God choosing Israel was, again, to spread his love, to show his love to the world. But Israel failed to do that. And so God became human and came to show us what God is like by being right here with us, Jesus, uh, living out divine love. You want to know what God is like? Look at Jesus. You want to know what God's will is? Look at Jesus. Listen to Jesus. Watch what Jesus does. So Jesus is the new Israel. He fulfills everything that Israel failed to do, everything that Adam, he's the new Adam. He's everything that Adam and Eve failed to do. Um, and his purpose is to spread God's love through his followers. Um, and he's given us the Holy Spirit to enable us to do that. So that is, of course, our task. Um, and so here in chapter 3, verse 13, we see the beginnings of this new family um, as he appoints uh, 12 of his followers to be apostles. Uh, and the word apostle simply means someone who is sent forth, uh, sent out to preach, to have authority, to cast out demons. Um, those, of course, aren't his only followers. Um, they, uh, he had lots of followers. It's just that he chose these 12 for the specific task of um, representing him in bringing down the kingdom of darkness and expanding the kingdom of light. Why does he choose 12? Well, because there were 12 tribes in Israel. So see, this is the new Israel. This is the new um, uh, family that God is uh, building. Now, that doesn't exclude all those other fa uh, followers. Uh, there was a whole group of people that followed him faithfully. Uh, in fact, the most faithful followers um, in the Gospels are a group of women. They're, they're the only ones who don't desert him and run away. Uh, they're the only ones who stay to the bitter end. They're the only ones who come back to uh, 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 anoint the body, you know, out of respect. And of course, Jesus appears, first of all, to women um, and charges them with, with uh, spreading the gospel. So, um, you know, when you, we talk about the apostles, it's not like they're the, these supermen by any means. It is interesting that Peter, James, and John are always listed first, and a lot of commentators um, um, make a big deal out of that. I'm not sure why they're listed first. It's, it's almost universally assumed that they're listed first because they were like an inner circle. They're sort of, well, not his favorites. That would be wrong because God doesn't have favorites. Um, but inner circle, I guess. Um, I don't know why they're listed first. It could be that 
Jesus can't trust them out of his sight, you know, and so he keeps them right nearby. I don't know. Um, but most of these, uh, most of the 12 apostles are rarely heard from again. Um, and in fact, that's, that's kind of the way it is throughout history. Most of those people that we might today call pillars of the church are ordinary people. They're, they're unknown to the wider world. Um, they live their lives. They serve God faithfully. Um, they uh, are in his presence awaiting the final resurrection. Um, but as far as the history books, um, they're not mentioned. Uh, so Jesus begins this new family, and as he does, opposition arises both from his family, his, his biological family, and also from the religious leaders. Uh, chapter 3, verse 21 says, when his family heard uh, uh, heard about uh, when his family heard well what it's talking about in context is about the crowds and the healings they went out to restrain him for people were saying he's gone out of his mind they they thought he was crazy and then the next paragraph begins in verse 22 and the scribes who came down from jerusalem said he has beelzebul and by the ruler of the demons, he casts out demons. Beelzebul, or some translations, it's uh, printed as Beelzebub. Might have heard it that way too. Uh, literally means Lord of the Flies. Um, described here as the ruler of the demons. Um, uh, so probably that's another name for Satan. Uh, unless this is like a general under Satan or something. I don't know. But anyway. Um, they said, by the ruler of the demons, he casts out demons. So Jesus is going to deal with that first, and then we'll come back to the family. And he deals with it in this paragraph in chapter 3, beginning in verse 22, running down through verse 30, where he talks about the unforgivable sin. And if you read the text carefully, you'll notice that Jesus does not say that they have committed the unforgivable sin. He does strongly imply that they are close to committing the unforgivable sin. So he's giving them a warning. He's not pronouncing final judgment, but he's saying essentially, you're, you're getting close. Uh, when, when you're attributing God's power to Satan, you're, you're, you're inching close to that which is unforgivable. You're not there yet. But be careful because you're you're getting close. You need to change your mind. You need to repent. You need to pull back. Um, you need to take a look at this. If you're so mixed up, if you're so uh, um, disconnected from God that you think God's power, well, which is doing good, setting people free, you know, healing people, all these wonderful things, uh, if you think that is satanic then something's seriously, seriously wrong with your heart. So be careful. Uh, so what is the unforgivable sin? Well, um, the unforgivable sin essentially is refusing to be forgiven. If a person absolutely refuses to let God forgive them, if a person uses their God-given free will to consistently their entire lives over and over again, say, God, no, I don't want you. I don't want your forgiveness. Go away. Leave me alone. If, if that's a person's attitude for life, if they never change from that, then that would be unforgivable. God cannot, the only thing God can't forgive is the refusal to be forgiven. And so if you're one of those people who's worried that you might have committed the unpardonable sin, the very fact that you're worried about it indicates that you haven't. Because people who are rejecting God don't care. They don't think about it. They're not worried about it. Um, so uh, so relax. Jesus loves you. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to say. Uh, then his family gets there. We already saw where it said that they were determined to go. And so they do. They go and they, they uh, it's crowded. They can't get in to see him. They send a message in. Uh, we're, we're out here. We want to see you. Well, what are they planning?
planning to do? Well, they're, they're planning to uh, seize him, the Greek says. Um, they, they apparently think that he needs to be deprogrammed. They're going to take him away. They're going to uh, get him out of here. And, and, you know, to their credit, they're doing it based on love. Um, they're worried about him. Um, he, he's not eating. He's not sleeping. He's doing. All, he's got these crowds around him. He's always caring for other people. You know, um, and so it's 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 not a um, it, it's not an evil motive that's bringing them there, but Jesus allows nothing, not even family love. He allows nothing to hinder his calling, nothing to stop him from what God is calling him to do. And so he replies, uh, who are my mother and my brothers? And looking at those who sat around him, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. You see, this is that new family that we were talking about. This is Jesus, the progenitor of a new family, the head of a new family. Uh, family of people who, who are with Jesus, learning from Jesus, how to be like Jesus, who are following Jesus as Jesus follows God. We become his brothers, his sisters, his mothers, his, you know, so forth. Um, we, we are the family, and that, and that is a um, family bond of that, that's a family bond which exceeds any other blood tie, any blood tie. So Jesus' true family, those who are with him, learning from him how to be like him. And to the degree that we act like Jesus, we show the world who God is. So we're part of his new family. We're part of this new tribe. We're part of the new Israel. Now, when I say that, um, I need to, we need to be a little bit careful there because people have taken that in the past and they have misused that um, and, and used it as an excuse for anti-Semitism. Um, they've come up with these, you know, these theories that the, the, the organized, institutionalized church has now replaced the nation of Israel. Well, nobody's replaced anybody. God loves everybody. And he wants everybody to be a part of this family, whether they're Jews or Gentiles or um, regardless of the color of their skin or the ethnicity or the language they speak or whatever. He wants everyone to be a part of this family. Um, and therefore, every human being is someone that we should look at as being of unsurpassable worth. They are created in the image and likeness of God, and God loves them so much that he sent his only begotten and much beloved son to die on the cross for them. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the history of the church with anti-Semitism is, is just one of the uh, most tragic, one of the saddest things there is. Um, the whole history of the uh, Inquisition and the Middle Ages, and it's, it's not just... Um, um, you know, you can't you can't just blame the Catholic Church for that, um, <laughs> because Protestants were just as bad. I mean, Martin Luther said some of the most uh, horrendously anti-Semitic things that you can you've ever imagined. Uh, so Jesus is the uh, head of a new family. Secondly, he's a visionary for a new world, and this is where we have this collection of parables here in chapter four this collection of parables. Now, Jesus tells us what the purpose of parables is. He tells us that in chapter 4, verses 10, 11, and 12. And basically what he's saying is that the purpose of parables is to paint verbal pictures, um, to communicate truth um, in, in a way that people can grasp and can understand. He's trying to stimulate people's imagination. Um, whenever, uh, most of the parables, you know, begin with a phrase like, uh, 
um, the kingdom of heaven is like, or the kingdom of, or what shall we liken the kingdom of God to, or something to that effect. Whenever you read that, uh, just in your mind, substitute the phrase, imagine a world where, and then read the parable. And, and you'll discover that it leaps to life. Because every parable, a parable is a word picture. And every parable has one central point. Don't get lost in the details. Don't get lost trying to figure out, well, well, let's see, there was a sower went forth to sow. So what is what do the thorns represent? And what does the ground represent? And, and who are the birds? And, you know, we, we can get so caught up in those kinds of things that we miss the purpose of the parable. Every parable has one central point. Imagine a world where these things are happening. And, and again, why use parables? Because the kingdom of God is so glorious. Now I'm talking about, I don't mean heaven. I don't mean where you go when you die. I mean the kingdom that God is building here on this earth, the kingdom that will be crowned when Jesus comes again. It's so glorious. It's so wonderful that it, it can only be hinted at with poetic language. Now, um, as Jesus is explaining what parables are, uh, he quotes from Isaiah 6, chapter, I mean, chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. He quotes from the Targum, which was a, an Aramaic um, translation of the Old Testament. Um, and it, his listeners would have been very familiar with it, and they would have been familiar with the context. If you take those, that verse, those verses out of context, it kind of sounds like God is purposely hard, hardening people's hearts. But we have to look, we, first of all, we have to see that verse in the context of the book of Isaiah. Secondly, we need to see this idea of hardening of hearts in the context of, of all of Scripture. And if we do that, we realize that the parables that Jesus is telling um, they're like the cloud in Exodus chapter 14. It was darkness to those who were opposed to God. It was light to those that were on God's side. That's the way parables are. Um, parables tell a story, and uh, some of them, for example, are specifically aimed at the religious leaders and their hypocrisy. And if they are not willing to admit that and see that, then you can see the parable itself uh, is darkness to them. They, they reject it more. It drives them back further into the darkness. Now, that's not the parable's fault. <laughs> it's, it's their choice. Um, so uh, God doesn't hide truth from people. And God doesn't go around hardening people's hearts, you know. Uh, we always read about, you know, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. But um, at least eight times, if, if I counted correctly, and I may not have, but I, <laughs> at least eight times, uh, we're, we're told that Pharaoh hardened his own heart. He made his heart obstinate. And then six times, again, if I counted correctly, uh, the scripture says that God, and sometimes it's translated hardened, Pharaoh's heart. Um, but it's a different Hebrew word. Um, the first one means that Pharaoh made his heart obstinate through an act of his will. The second word means that God confirmed the choice that Pharaoh has already made. God confirms choices. He does not harden hearts. I think that's important to remember. So first of all, Jesus tells, uh, or the first one in Mark's collection here, is the parable of the sower. Um, he tells the parable in verses 1 through 8, and then he explains the parable to his disciples in verses 13 through 20. And you know the story. A sower went forth to sow, and some seed fell on good ground, and some among the thorns, and some on the pathway, and some of the birds ate. Um, what's Jesus saying there? He's saying, imagine a world where God is like a sower of seeds. He never seems to run out of seed because he's sowing this way and that way. He has this abundance of seed and he's extravagant and he's just throwing them everywhere. 
Um, and, 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 you know, the picture you get is of, of God sort of um, skipping through the fields, you know, sowing seeds and uh, up and left and right and front and back. Imagine a world where God is like that, where God's extravagant, where God is abundant. Imagine a world where we humans are free to decide what kind of soil we want to be. Are you with me? See, you know, the, again, we, we, we lose the meaning by getting too into the details. We think, well, you know, the soil can't help. But it, well, of course it can't. That's not the point. <laughs> This is really the parable of the soils. Which one are you going to be? Are you going to be good ground? Um, it's your choice. Imagine a world where we're free to grow, where we're free to learn and to question and produce the fruit of love. To be good soil, all you have to do is just simply turn your heart towards God and say, I want to be teachable, Lord. Teach me. The second parable in Mark's list is the parable of the lamp. Jesus said to them, is a lamp brought in to be put under a bushel basket or under the bed and not on the lampstand? For there is nothing hidden except to be disclosed, nor is anything secret except to come to light. If you have ears to hear, then hear. What's he saying there? He's saying, imagine a world where light, joy, peace, justice, and harmony shine forth. It's not hidden someplace where you have to dig for it. It's obvious. It shines forth. It gives light to everything around it. Imagine a world where people listen to each other and are open and teachable and care for one another. Imagine a world where Jesus, the light of the world, is lifted up for everybody to see. Imagine a world like that. It goes on. Pay attention to what you hear. The measure you give will be measure, the, the measure you get, and it will be added to you. For to those who have, more will be given, and from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. That, I'm told by scholars, is a Jewish proverb um, that Jesus is quoting there. And basically, it means the more teachable you are, the more you're going to learn. That's the wonderful thing about exploring. Any anything, any area of study, um, the the more you explore, the the more questions you have, and the more you get to learn, and it gets more and more fascinating. You never run out of stuff, you know. Uh, it's an endless library. The point that Jesus is making there is to to be open, to be teachable, to have ears to hear what the Holy Spirit says to you, and then he continues on the kingdom of god is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground and would sleep and rise night and day and the seed would sprout and grow he doesn't know how the earth produces of itself first the stalk then the head then the full grain in the head and when the grain is ripe at once he goes in with his sickle because the harvest has come uh, this parable is only found in the gospel of mark it's not in the other three gospels, this parable of the harvest. And again, all parables have one central point. So what is, what is Jesus saying here? He's saying, I believe, imagine a world of mystery and wonder filled with the fruit of human compassion. Imagine a world without war, without hunger. Imagine a world where God's kingdom is, is, Spreading and growing, but it's not spectacular. It's not in a forced way. It doesn't come through, you know, uh, uh, some uh, great political election or through as a result of some massive war or anything like that. God's kingdom is uh, working, as it were, slowly behind the scenes. It's God's work. And he invites us to participate in it. My beautiful wife, Kathy, loves to garden, as most of you know. Uh, but she doesn't make the flowers grow, you know. Uh, she cooperates with God in making a beautiful garden. That's the way the kingdom of God is. 
Jesus said, also said, what can we compare the kingdom of God? With what can we compare the kingdom of God? Or what parable will we use for it? It's like a mustard seed which when sown upon the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on the earth. Uh, that's a bit of hyperbole. It's not the smallest seed. It's, uh, yeah. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs and puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. Imagine a world where Christ followers collectively provide shelter, safety, shade for all of God's creation. Imagine a world like that. See, these parables are inviting us to imagine a new world, to imagine a world filled with Jesus. It's something I think we need to take time to do on a regular basis. And then finally, in our study today, we look at Jesus, the victor over the forces of darkness. The story starts in chapter 4, verse 35. It runs through chapter 5, verse 20. And the first part of the story, chapter 4, 35 to 41, you're familiar with. Jesus goes out with his disciples in a boat. And he's asleep in the stern of the boat. Uh, he's at perfect peace. He's perfectly calm. Suddenly a very violent storm hits the lake. Um, the disciples are freaked out. And, and remember that, that a bunch of these guys, most of these guys are, are professional fishermen. Um, so it takes a lot to get them upset. Anyway, um, they're convinced that they're all gonna die. Jesus is still asleep. So they wake him up and, and they say, don't you care that we're gonna perish? And so Jesus, you know, gets up. I, I picture him getting up um, very calmly, no, no panic. And literally, he calms the storm by saying, be muzzled. It's exactly the same phrase that he uses when he's dealing with demons. And I think Mark's point here, or one of his points, is that uh, demonic forces can be behind killer storms. Now, I, I don't mean that, you know, when a hurricane uh, rips across the uh, peninsula that we call Florida and causes uh, billions of dollars of damage and takes lives, I, I don't mean that that's all satanic. Um, I mean that if you trace it back far enough, there are demonic forces behind that. Um, yes, humans have, have disrupted the weather patterns and in more intense storms are happening everywhere around the globe as a result of, of uh, our lack of stewardship. But essentially, what does that do? When, when we're not doing what we're supposed to do as a human race, um, it allows uh, for the forces of darkness to move in with their chaos. We're supposed to be pushing back the chaos by, in this case, taking care of the environment. We don't do that, the chaos comes rushing back in, and the author of that chaos uh, is the Satan. So Jesus rebukes the storm, and, and uh, of course it immediately stops, and the disciples are, are flabbergasted and Jesus says, well, wh what's wrong with you guys? Why'd you, why'd you freak out? Um, don't you have any faith? Um, the, the point here is that Jesus is Lord of the elements. And in the Jewish mind, only those, uh, only God could control the elements. So it's underscoring the fact that this is God in human flesh. As far as application goes, if Jesus is in your boat, it can't sink. Whatever your boat is, <laughs> it can't sink. Um, just a, a, a little archaeological thing that I think is fascinating. Um, a few years ago, archaeologists found um, the uh, shell of a first century fishing boat in the mud under the bottom of the Sea of Galilee. 
And that's it in the top picture there. It is on display in uh, uh, Nof Ginnasar, which is, which is a kibbutz right on the Sea of Galilee. Uh, the bottom picture is a reproduction that was made based on the real thing, which is the top picture. So the bottom picture is what it would have looked like. Um, and in, in the picture there, it looks smaller than it really is. That, that, that boat can easily hold 18 people. Um, and um, the, the bench across the stern is apparently where Jesus was curled up and sound asleep, you know. Um, in, in the picture there, uh, the, the water behind that boat is the Sea of Galilee. Uh, the hills off in the distance uh, are the Golan Heights, and that's where uh, Jesus was headed with his disciples. That's where the demoniac was. That's where the demons went into the pigs. One of those cliffs is where the pigs um, went jumping off and drowned. Um, if you were to go to the sort of the upper right um, side of the uh, of the photo there, uh, you'd be headed south, and the Sea of Galilee feeds into the Jordan River. Um, so, yeah, interesting, isn't it? Jesus and the disciples, after that storm, they get to the other side. Uh, this is the story in chapter 5. Um, and immediately they're confronted with this demoniac, this man. Was, and this is one of the, the saddest and, and most hopeless cases th that you could ever imagine. Um, th this fellow is likely a Gentile. A lot of Gentiles lived in that area. Um, doesn't really matter. In either case, it's hopeless. Um, but he, he's, he's naked. He's violent. He's possessed by demons. He lives in the graveyard. Um, he is despised by everybody. He's feared by everybody. Um, he represents, especially if he's Gentile, he represents everything that Jews considered to be unclean, uh, kind of all bundled up in one. His case is absolutely hopeless. He has a legion of demons inside of him. A Roman legion was anywhere between 5,500 and 6,000 soldiers. So we're talking about thousands and thousands of demons inside this man. And I think that probably explains why this is the only time that when Jesus rebukes demons, they don't immediately flee. Uh, there's this conversation that takes place. Uh, what is your name? Our, our name is Legion, for we are many. Um, you know, why have you come to torment us before our time, you know, and please let us go into the pigs. Isn't it interesting that the occupying Roman army, that was the, the, the army that was occupying Israel at that time, was the famous um, Roman 10th Legion. And the standard of the 10th legion is there in the picture for you. And you can see it has a boar, a wild pig, uh, was, um, was their symbol. So there are people here, and they are swine herdsmen. They're raising pigs. Um, they may have even been Jews raising pigs, but whoever's raising them, why are they raising all these pigs? I mean, they're not going to find customers among the Jewish population, which is the majority of people in this whole region. Well, they're raising these pigs to feed the occupying Roman 10th Legion. They, they are aiding and abetting the occupying forces that are making life miserable for people. These same Roman soldiers that are crucifying people all over the place and that are um, instigating these raids of terror on all these innocent little towns. Um, these swine herdsmen are raising pigs to feed them, um, which is why they get upset. Uh, Jesus casts out the pigs, I mean casts out the demons. The demons go into the pigs, the pigs go crazy, and they run and 
dive off the cliff and they drown. I've, I've run into people that say, oh, the poor little pigs, you know. Um, yeah, I, you know, God likes pigs. I'm sure he does. <laughs> but uh, in this case, these particular pigs were being raised to feed the occupying army. Um, they're being raised in territory which is Jewish. They're not supposed to be doing this anyway. And um, so uh, Jesus, I think, is uh, just helping to clean house a little bit here. Um, but notice the reaction of the herdsmen. They come forth and they beg Jesus to go away. Why? Because he's messing up their business. And sometimes if you live for Jesus and you apply the principles of Jesus, it'll mess up your business. <laughs> it, it, you know, you can't exploit people. You can't rip people off. You, you, you can't be dishonest in, in your dealings with people if you're going to follow Jesus. So um, Jesus, Jesus can really um, threaten the local economy. Um, and that's okay with him, I think. Um, meanwhile, the man is completely healed, totally set free, which is phenomenal when you stop and think about it. Um, and he says, I, I want to follow you. Um, I want to come with you. And Jesus says, no, stay over here and just tell everybody what God's done for you. And so, as far and that's where we leave him. As far as we know, this guy I don't know how old he was when it start all this started, but for whatever years he had left, uh, I just picture him uh, going all over what today are the Golan Heights, uh, from village to village. There were ten towns in that particular region, um, telling people again and again and again what the power of God can do. There's nothing more powerful than a testimony. And, uh, of course, this guy has a, a, a really, really radical testimony. Jesus, our precious Jesus, <laughs> is so glorious. And what is he like? Well, he's building a new family. He's a visionary of a new world. Imagine a world that looks like this instead of the way it is. And he is a God who sets the captives free. Storms that threaten people's lives. Um, demons that make people insane. He comes and he confronts and he sets free because he is filled with an abundance of love. Father, we thank you for your loving kindness. We thank you, Lord, for showing us your heart in Jesus. We thank you for the privilege of being adopted into your new family with a whole new group of sisters and brothers. We thank you, Father God, for giving us a vision of a new world filled with love, filled with abundance, filled with grace, filled with mercy, filled with dance and happiness and joy. A new world where no one is hungry and where no one is violent and where no one is sick or incarcerated or or locked in cycles of poverty, a new world where everyone is treated with justice and love. Thank you for showing us that world, and thank you for being the one who sets the captives free. There's nothing that's too hard for you. And so, Lord, give us faith to pray for those that cross our paths, even those that we look at maybe and think, gosh, there's very little hope for him or for her. Help us to remember, Lord, there's always hope in you. And now, Lord, as we come to your table to partake of the bread which you broke and said was your body broken for us, to partake of the cup 
which you said was the new covenant in your blood. As we do so, Lord, may this just be a little appetizer, a little taste of the marriage supper of the Lamb of that glorious time when you're going to come and righteousness is going to cover the earth as the waters cover the sea and wolves are going to lie down with lambs and lions are going to eat hay like ox little children are going to play in the streets of the city and take up poisonous snakes and they won't hurt them <laughs> oh lord as we partake of communion tonight bind our hearts to all the other members of your forever family and give us a taste of that kingdom which is to come and so i invite you now to take the bread And recall that Jesus broke it, blessed it, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body broken for you. In Jesus' name. And I also invite you to take the cup. And recall that Jesus lifted up the cup at the Last Supper and said, Take and drink from this, all of you, for this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup in remembrance of me. Bless this cup, we pray, Lord, a taste of the feast to come. Amen. Thank you, Father God. Thank you for being making us part of your new family, and thank you for the new world that you're beginning to build, that you are building all around us, in us, and will complete. Oh, Lord, your kingdom come. Your will be done here on earth, as it is in the heavens. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.